you're going along and you want to build and you say, oh, I'm just near life. If you have one thing wrong, it doesn't work. Nobody knows how this thing is solved. There he goes by Jim. He's Professor of Material Science and Nano Engineering at Rice University in Houston. And Jim is regarded as one of the leading voices in the world responding to origins of life research. We don't even know how to make the molecules. We are lost on how to do this. We can't even make the basic building blocks. As we will see, he is very emphatic about his rejection of abiogenesis as a feasible process. I'm going to uh, address his video and just try to give a full teaching on abiogenesis over 14 different videos. In conclusion, James is an embarrassment to the scientific community that never seems to learn his lesson. In this ooze emerged the first life. I find it problematic in that there's an extrapolation from a very small experiment in a laboratory. Researchers have now created life from non-living parts. There were many kinds of molecules in the primordial soup. I'm boiling up some primordial soup. Your entire civilization, it all begins right here in this little pond of goo. I've got a series for you coming up here. This is in rebuttal to Dave Farina's two-part series on abiogenesis, where he again had everything wrong, every slide he had wrong. Hey everyone, so some of you are aware of my- Greatest video. thing that he did though, is he brought on three so-called experts to talk about origin of life. So we can go right after their research and I dissect their research, the research of the experts. But what Dave Farina didn't notice is that every argument that he had absolutely fell apart. So this first series is going to just go after the experts and then show how Dave Farina was wrong on every one of his points. But then we'll have a second series after this series that will go after every other part of Dave Farina's videos where he can't even get the structure of soap right. So this is going to be an amazing series. Again, without ad hominem attacks, I'm not attacking him. I'm not saying anything bad about uh, uh, who he is or what his motives are. And he keeps trying to be the great scientific communicator, but he's unable to do it. So I hope you enjoy this series. If you like it, give us a thumbs up and subscribe and you'll see when each new section is coming out. Last year, I made a video about James Tour, a chemist and creationist who speaks out against origin of life research. He didn't like it much, so he decided to make a 14-part series about how dumb I am. I never called Dave Farina dumb. If he came out looking dumb after my presentation, I mean, I just presented the data. The only thing that I said is he's wrong, he's wrong, he's wrong. And then he says he really pulled out all the stops parading all of his classical fallacious talking points and plenty of bold-faced lies and deliberate misrepresentations of scientific research peppered in for good measure. Honestly, I was rather shocked at how stupid it was. With such material to work with, I ended up with quite a lot to say in response and had to split it into two parts. First of all, I'm not going to uh, partake in the ad hominem attacks, nor am I going to psychoanalyze Dave Farina and why he does what he does. Uh, Dave believes that his, the comments by the researchers that, that work in the origin of life, I have repeatedly said that workers, people who work in the area of origin of life, write many things in their papers that just are not true according to the data in that very paper. And this misunderstanding has come because of the projections of those who work in the area of origin of life. They do one little thing and then they extrapolate it and then they work with the press to ramp it up even more and they project as if they really know it. 
And so the lay person reads this and says, ah, you see, scientists understand. But I don't think it's fair to put the blame on scientists. The blame belongs to the press. The blame is with the media outlets, not with the scientists. I think the blame is not just with the media outlets. The blame is also with the scientists who work in the area of origin of life. And that's what I hope to show you. What Dave then does is he brings on experts and he believes what they say. So we'll go right after his experts. Dave claims that the reason I can't understand origin of life is because I am a synthetic organic chemist. Origin of life research is an interdisciplinary field that includes not just areas of chemistry James has no experience with, but also physics, astronomy, geology, information theory, probability, statistics, and yet other fields. Thanks for watching, guys. He can understand it. I don't know what his area of expertise is. He can understand it, but I can't because I'm a synthetic chemist. Because I'm a synthetic chemist, I can't understand it. So what does Dave Farina do? He invites in three experts to come and speak with him. Interestingly, every one of those experts that he brings in is a synthetic chemist. Oh, the irony. None of the experts that he brings in commented on any of the things that I specifically said in that series. None of them. I had that vetted by two PhD chemists. In the end, interestingly, we'll show that his experts end up agreeing with me and not with Dave on multiple occasions. But Dave never noticed it because he's unable to understand the chemistry. For example, he brings in Bruce Lipschitz of UC Santa Barbara as one of his experts. He says, Bruce Lipschitz is commenting on my video where I talked about protein synthesis being impossible in water, that protein synthesis doesn't happen in water. Interestingly enough, Bruce Lipschitz is a friend of mine. I have known him for 35 years, more than 35 years, almost 40 years I've known Bruce. Bruce said he never saw my video. He had sent Dave his video on some other topic. He was not responding to the video that I had done, but Dave put it in there as if it was from me. But Dave calls me a liar. I'm not gonna say anything about Dave, but interestingly enough, Bruce didn't even know it was put in there. We'll look at that in detail. Uh, he brings in another expert. He brings in Steve Benner, founder of the Foundation for Applied Molecular Evolution. Steve Benner made zero comments on the series that I had. He didn't talk about anything. I confronted him on this uh, and, and I pushed him on it. I said, look, you said in the video that you watched all 10 hours of this. You didn't respond to anything in the video. Did you really watch all 10 hours? He says, well, well, you know, it, it was on, but I was doing other things. Oh, it was on, but he was doing other things. So he watched, he turned on one video, had it playing, but was doing other things. When that got done, he turned on video number two had it playing, but was doing other things. Okay, so we'll look at Steve Benner and we'll look at the very work that he cites. Why do I have to wait this long? Because Steve Benner talked about work that was done by a researcher in his group, uh, uh, Biondi, and I wanted to see the publication. I wrote to him for a co copy of the publication. He wouldn't send it. I said, where is it published? It wasn't published. It didn't publish till more than a year after the video that he talked about. Brings in a third expert, Lee Cronin, who calls me nefarious, yet he himself never answered any of the obstacles. He loves his primordial soup model. He says it's a good model. Well, then ask him, how do you go from the small molecules to a living cell? And he said, well, we, 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 we know about stars. We know, we'll look at those videos. He never comments because he has no idea. He says it's a good model, but he has no idea. We'll expose all of this on Lee Cronin. And then he talks a lot about his own work in Origin of Life. The types of things that Dave loves to read and, and uh, pull little quotes out. He tells me I quote mine. We'll see Dave's quotes when I look right at the data. I go right at the data, not just what they write. And I'll show that Lee Cronin's work in Origin of Life is nonsense. It has nothing to do with the origin of life. Certainly not life as we know it. Amazingly, Lee Cronin knows nothing about organic chemistry. That's not my opinion. That's somebody else says that, that I think Lee Cronin himself would even respect. I'm an inorganic chemist, so I don't know any organic chemistry. Lee, you don't know any organic chemistry. I wouldn't have used such strong words, but you said it yourself. I'll teach you today. If you had watched my series, you might have learned something. I'll also address his cited experts, Joshua Swamidas, and I'll talk about Jack Sostek, but he uses their data.
I want to thank Dave for bringing in these experts because now I can go right after these experts and show their work, their very own work and their own, own words and talk about how origin of life from the very researchers themselves, not just YouTubers getting it wrong, the very researchers themselves look at the data and they see one thing and they write another. Their data exposes it and they write another. Well, he didn't take kindly to it, so he decided to make a 14-part series about how dumb I am. And he made a 14-part series about how dumb I am. Dave is dumb, Dave is dumb, Dave is dumb every 10 seconds. And it's like, he said those okay. words? I haven't even watched his 14-part series, but does he kind of uh, say those words? Or he not dumb. Like dumb. He, he calls me clueless. He has no idea what he's talking about. Dave says that I talked about how dumb he was. No way. I never talked about how dumb he was. I never commented on his intellect. Uh, I crossed this out because I, I don't think anybody here is stupid. Uh, that's not a question of stupidity. It's just a lack of knowledge. And, and I think that there's just a lack of knowledge that, that people presume with great confidence. They have very high confidence. In another way, Dave is a victim. Dave is a victim. Dave Farina is a victim of the nonsense that these people are putting out there. And that's what we're going to expose today. If Dave is so confident about his work, why does he throttle the discussion that goes on under his videos? So his videos, people comment, but if they comment and they point things out that are against what he said, he deletes it. I block very liberally because mm -hmm. I just don't want to deal with it. I'm not going to get yeah. into a back and forth that lasts a week with 100 different people simultaneously. I'm just not going to deal with it. This, this channel is my space. And if I don't, if I mm -hmm. want to block or if I want to delete spam comments or if I want to do any of that stuff, that's my choice and I do that. And I don't care mm -hmm. what people say about that. say to that? Would you be interested in having a one-on-one -on -one conversation with him if uh, he was willing uh, to do so? Oh, I would love that. I mean, he seems like a fine young man. I'd love to get together with him. We'll have a live stream so nobody's going to edit that. I will pay to have him fly to Houston I'll buy his ticket to Houston and I'll put him up either at a hotel or if he wants, he can stay in my home. We have a guest room. He can have dinner with me and my wife and my family and, and tell us all about himself. Let's start looking at the primordial soup. This is something where Dave says that this, the primordial soup model is only taught to eighth graders, not in any advanced textbook. When one looks at a typical textbook, one will see a, some prehistoric pond and molecules and those molecules coming together and forming a cell and those cells coming together and some slithering creature coming out of this pond. That is fallacious. There is no truth in that. This is one version of a talking point Jim brings up a lot. He hates how in some textbooks you see a primordial soup of molecules, some lightning, and then all of a sudden a cell is there, and then maybe a lizard crawling onto land, or something like that. To call this a complete view of abiogenesis and evolution would be absurd, but absolutely no one proposes this. This is something that a lot of creationists do. They refer to what is very obviously a textbook meant for middle school students and pretend it represents the pinnacle of scientific thought on the matter. Sixth graders have zero capacity to understand biochemistry, so their textbook doesn't have any biochemistry in it. A college-level textbook will not look like this, so this is a dishonest talking point. Here's all of them that are mentioning the primordial soup or the hot smelly soup model. All of them mention it. 
Here's more. And this isn't all of them. This is just all that I could compile with the help of Casey Luskin, who is another Team Jesus person, as Dave Farina would call him, and therefore wants to discount whatever he says. But I'll tell you, Dave, Team Jesus people keep eating your lunch. Let's hear how Lee Cronin explains going from small molecules in a pond to a living cell, primordial soup model. Okay, so there was some kind of primordial soup mm -hmm. billions of years ago on the surface of Earth. Chemicals swimming around, maybe bolts of lightning going off, uh, and somehow something happened and poof, you've got your first sort of very simple cell or something mm -hmm. uh, swimming around in the ocean. Okay, that's that's the my GCSE vague recollection of what might have been explained as how life mm -hmm. got here. What's, um, is that view essentially correct or fundamentally wrong? Um, what's the big problem that people have, why they haven't, up till now at least, been able to give a sort of naturalistic scientific explanation for, for how all those right bits got together to, to create life? So that was Justin's, uh, Justin's comment, and he was asking that of Lee Cronin, who is an origin of life researcher, one of the top well-known ones. And here's what Lee said. So a really important, so you're not wrong, your GCSE chemistry is not, is not too bad at all. Whoa! You're not wrong? Wow, could you cut him off a little faster, James? Literally the very next word he says is but to qualify and contextualize this first phrase. Okay, so I cut him off because he doesn't say anything. He absolutely doesn't start explaining anything, but we'll just let him speak. You're not wrong. Your GCSE chemistry uh, is not is not too bad at all. But the planet Earth wasn't just this magic melting pot of magical chemicals. It's the same planet now. Why are you so afraid to let your viewers hear Lee speak? Well, he's going to talk for a bit right now, if that's okay with you. Yeah, so um, the way that that, was, um, that audio was cut was just outrageous um, because what I was trying to do was make a a connection with the interviewer to say, yeah, your basic, anyone with basic chemistry can start to understand the uh, consequences of evolution. And uh, basically all I was saying is that very basic, very basic chemistry introduces the concept of molecules and reactions and complexity. And with those ideas together and some time, you are able to get to evolution. That is what the current scientific consensus is saying is what all the, the uh, experiments are showing. And what James was trying to do was to, is to misquote me as to make some kind of reverse psychological um, connotation. So you see, he never told us. He never told us. He says that, that, that uh, uh, this is current scientific consensus. You got it right on that, Lee. That's current scientific consensus, which I don't go for. And you want everybody to start following you like you're the Pied Piper? I'm going to expose this for what it is. You talk about scientific consensus? Galileo should have followed scientific consensus if it were, if it were your decision, right? No, sometimes things have to be said, and that's what I'm doing. I don't care what the scientific consensus is. You didn't explain. He gave you the chance to explain. You didn't do it on Briarly's program. He gave you the chance to explain yourself here. You didn't do it here. Well, maybe I cut you off too quickly. Let's give you another chance. Maybe in another video you might have done this. You're not wrong. Your GCSE chemistry is not, is not too bad at all. But the planet Earth wasn't just this magic melting pot of magical chemicals. It's the same planet now, mm. but it's got life on it. And the problem we have with looking for life on Earth right now, the origin of life, is there's already populated by... Uh, our current biology. Yes. So cells emerged and created an ecosystem and there's DNA and RNA and bacteria all over the planet. And they have terraformed the planet from bacterial mats in the ocean to human beings burning forests, building aeroplanes, runways. So it's very difficult to go back and ask where did life come from when life is polluting. So that's the first point. But the second point, I would say that actually there is nothing magical about the emergence of life. It's really simple. And what we've got to try and do, and I really like, again, coming back to the prize and the idea of where does information come from, um, universes without life are universes without information. 
Mm. Okay, and I think Perry and I really uh, really agree on that point, but I'll let him comment on mm. that in a moment. Mm. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to produce a system, a chemical system that produces its own context. Now, I don't like that word, and your listeners are probably like, what do you mean by that? And it's a <laughs> bit like what happens is the chemistry is random, mm -hmm. okay, until a chance event, and that's not a lucky event, so that means an improbable event on a probability distribution, like if I play cards, I might get a royal mm -hmm. flush, mm -hmm. but I'd have to calculate how long I have to play randomly. Yeah. Once I've got that royal flush, that royal flush doesn't mean to anyone unless I'm playing cards. Yeah. But suddenly, if that royal flush itself created the player to recognize royal flush, you have a feedback loop. So actually, when you then re remove the need for magic random, it's any random. Okay. Any random event gets trapped in a bubble in a rock mm -hmm. and that then allows to another random event to be slightly less random because of what's in that rock because you're basically you're taking a coin and you've weighted it so you get slightly more heads and tails and then that coin is able to make other coins that are slightly more heads and tails before you know it you're only flicking heads so what you can do is you can do a model and show how many times do I need that to happen for I always go from heads and tails evens to always getting heads and that type of discussion is how we're creating experiments to create life. Okay, you're flipping coins, you got royal flushes. Tell me the chemistry. You're a chemist, tell us the chemistry. How does this happen? No royal flushes, just bring me through the chemistry here. You think people shouldn't get frustrated about your mumbo jumbo nonsense? This is characteristic of origin of life, folks. It's not just Lee Cronin, he's one of many. You try to pin him down and he doesn't say it. Well, let's see. Let's give him another chance. I make salad dressing a lot in my lab. And in fact, salad dressing is probably the most important thing for the origin of life. That is oil in water. Okay. What happens when you shake oil in water? You get bubbles form spontaneously. Mm. Some molecules can dissolve in those bubbles in different ways. And each bubble has a different set of molecules in them. And you can fingerprint that using a device mm -hmm. similar to what you'd make maybe test your blood to look at. Okay. So if every droplet is different, suddenly you have individuals. If individuals are now interacting in those droplets all bashing around in that salad dressing, they can compete with each other, they can cooperate together, and they can start to record but, stuff. But we're still talking at this point about inorganic chemistry, right? Correct. So, so and, and I suppose that the thing I'm trying to get my head around is, is it feels like there's a big difference between a kind of a chemical which has no sort of teleology that it just is what it is mm -hmm. and and a a system which kind of has this trajectory if so you like is, to, to start replicating and so that's a really life. important point you're making so for me teleology is a teleology is a word i only learned a few months ago <laughs> but actually i now know what it means so i can retort you so i would say like if i design a fork yes to pick up something i know it's a fork uh -huh. but if i observe a fork arising and I look at the pathway assembly of the fork and say well actually it's below my threshold it mm. could have emerged mm. but but an agency built that fork when I can discern the number of features so what I mean is at you've chemistry is at the border between a teleological if that's a word okay. and teleological system okay and when the chemistry is able to create um, um, it basically is able to affect itself in the future that then becomes teleological. Right. It crosses over from inorganic to organic. Exactly. Or, and and that is, and yeah. that's really the exciting discovery we're trying to make. Perry wants to pay for. <laughs> no, I, I mean that in a sense, not, <laughs> yeah. not just my, my lab, but anyone's no. lab competing. Yeah. He wants yeah. to see, and yeah. I'm, I'm putting this precisely so he can challenge, and Dennis mm. can challenge, mm. that a, a self-generating system for tele that's teleologically generating yeah. objects and what you're saying is like oh boy dna we're convinced it evolves but how did that happen sure and i would say evolution occurs firstly in bubbles uh -huh. right over the bubble so you imagine like a massive system disorganized yeah. chemistry persisting as that persists over time it has to compress those features and stop errors creeping in and what happens over time is polymers get formed so what is a polymer polymer is when two ping pong balls if you like are able to come together and rather bounce off one another they connect and then it's two ping pong balls yeah. connected together so you have double the information before and so on and you get the kind of daisy it's, chaining it's bubbles it's, it's all about bubbles really bubbles you get polymers how do you do the chemistry to get the polymers this is so exacting. We're going to go through this. We're going to show the polymers that you've made are garbage. Garbage. 
They're not proteins. They're not what you want. It doesn't give you what you want. This is what I'm talking about. It's just, this is so painful. Have you had enough? You've probably had enough of Lee Cronin. But how about, j- just give me one proposal. You, you don't have to tell us how it happened. That's not what I'm asking for. Is how might it have happened that you substantiate the primordial soup model? How might it have happened? Just sketch out the big picture here, because uh, a lot of people assume, okay, uh, maybe they learned this in GCSE biology or mm-hmm. something, but, you know, okay, so there was kind of some kind of primordial soup. Mm -hmm. billions of years ago on the surface of Earth. Chemicals swimming around, maybe bolts of lightning going off, uh, and somehow something happened and poof, you've got your first very simple cell or something Mm -hmm. uh, swimming around in the ocean. Is that view essentially correct or fundamentally wrong so you're not wrong your gcse chemistry uh, is not is not too bad at all you asked you said is, is that this you essentially, essentially correct or fundamentally, fundamentally wrong? wrong unquote and lee said you're, you're not, not wrong. wrong your gcse chemistry uh, is not is not too bad at, at all. all and i'm like what where is the evidence for this and and i'm like this is the type of extrapolation that i'm talking about from one of the premier people in the world in origin of life, and I'm saying, okay, you got evidence for me? Help me, give me the evidence for that, Lee. Give me the evidence, I'd love to have it. It's clear that chemicals on Earth before life were simpler because there was no machinery to make chemicals. Um, The debate that I think you're digging into a debate that origin of life people have that I was giving just in a GCSE, not a a degree in chemistry, and that um, I don't care whether the atmosphere is oxidizing or reducing. We simply don't know. We can look at the fossil record, the geological record, and so on and so forth, and ask those questions. However, for meteorites that we have from the uh, solar system, from where the birth of the solar system is, we know what type of chemicals are present, and basically... When you look at, uh, say, Murchison or other meteorites, carbonaceous chondrites, we find very simple organic molecules with some nitrogen and oxygen, some carbon, some hydrogen, maybe a bit of sulfur, you know, the elements that we'd expect we find on Earth, very simple versions. So all I was saying was that. Now, I think that, Jim, you've got to be careful here because you are trying to build a narrative. And building narratives and what I'm not, I'm not interested in, I didn't, that... G- his GCSE chemistry was fine. GCSE high school chemistry was there simple chemistry on Earth? Was there was there some energy on Earth? All those things, to the best of our knowledge, yes, there was energy. Um, there was a lot of things going on. There's a great deal of evidence for large, the large heavy, uh, the late heavy bombardment and all that stuff. But if you want concrete evidence, you can get meteors that are 4.7 billion years old, which have simple chemistry on them. And I think the thing that we are, you're maybe creating a straw man here, because I think we basically agree that in the past, chemistry looks to have been simpler. We have seen no evidence of complex chemistry emerging before life on Earth. And complex, I would say, large molecules that you can hold in your hand, maybe that you can manufacture in your lab. And there is good evidence for that. There's plenty of peer-reviewed publications which talk about that, that information. Now, it doesn't, doesn't suggest it doesn't there is not evidence for what how, how what the lifetime is of erasure and the and the half-life of that complexity however we are beginning through very radioactive uh, carbon dating um heavy atom atom carbon dating and looking at the entropy of material the disorder of the material to kind of piece together if there was something complex there but that is a very very hard problem so i would disagree with you that justin's chemistry is just fine um I don't know what the precise nature of that is, and maybe what you're getting at is some origin of life people says, look, it was reducing, then it was oxidizing, then there was phosphorus, and then there was sugar, and there was RNA. No, we have, I would agree with you, there is no evidence about what sequence of small molecules were there, but was there a super simple molecules there on Earth at the beginning? Yes. And we can trace it back to the Big Bang, where there we have proof that there was a Big Bang, and then we have uh, um, uh, stars forming and those stars explode. And when those stars explode, they produce elements in their elemental form. And when they accrete on a planet, they then gain complexity. Mm. OK, yes. Feel free to respond there, Jim. OK, so, so, Lee, that's not what you said and that's not what you put forward. I agree. We have small molecules no, that are, said. might I be oxidizing. Me. There might, no, I might... did not say anything else. That's exactly what I said. Justin said, was there a prebiotic soup? And I said, yes, the evidence says so. No, and Justin said, 
then cells came forth, life came forth from that. All right, so well, you, that, you is, were, well, that is indeed you, you correct. You are a little what bit loose on that. Let, 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 let's get more okay. specific. But what I'm saying is, you are the authority here. When you tell him, he asked you specifically. He says there was a primordial soup, and life came forth, and your very simple cells came forth from this. We have no evidence how this thing happened. Lots oh, of small molecules. That, that, you know, a cell's pretty complex. We don't know how it happened, but the evidence on Earth says in the fossil record that life appeared very, very quickly, okay, after the late heavy bombardment. So that is evidence in the fossil record that is not disputable. I think we both agree, planet Earth formed, rocks, simple chemistry, no life, right? We don't know all the details of that, but then within a few hundred million years, there's evidence in the fossil record that life formed simple cellular life. Those two facts are not, as far as I know, disputed by those. Science, those science those are not contestable. Community. How we got from the point A to point B? Absolutely, we're but we're I didn't clueless. say. I did not say <laughs> okay. we knew. Right. So, so point. we're agree. Okay. We, so we keep, you and I agree, Lee, that how we got from the simple molecules to life, it happened, but we don't know how. Exactly. So that, If you're enjoying this series, give us a thumbs up and click the subscribe button, and that way you'll hear when we're coming out with new videos. There are no salaried employees in this organization. All the accounting, all the legal work, that's all done by friends of mine. The only thing that I have to pay for is the production work, and if you could help us out with that, I'd appreciate it. There's a link below where you can just click on that and help us in several different ways. Thank you.